Okay, here we go. This is fatty acid anabolism day two, and we're going to be making the fat today. Last time we built um, all the pieces that we needed, and this time we're actually going to put them together. Um, so you should be able to state the cellular locations for two of the enzyme, the two enzymes today, acetyl-CoA carboxylase and fatty acid synthase. Draw the process of fatty acid synthase, all the substrates and products. Um, this is an analogous to taking the beta oxidation cycle and going in reverse. Um, state the purpose of fatty acid carboxylase with respect to fatty acid anabolism. Write the overall chemical equation for each of these enzymes. Oh, how many? Oh, and then the overall chemical equation for fatty, for fatty acid synthesis. So please note that synthase is an enzyme. Carboxylase is an enzyme. When you add these two enzymes together, you get the process of fatty acid synthesis, SIS. Um, and then after this, we should be able to describe how when you eat too much sugar, it's made into fat um, and not exactly the other way around. All right. So I had this one last time. Um, this is our story. There's no fat in sugar. So why is it that eating a lot of sugar makes us fat, quote unquote fat? Um, so, again, the scenario is that you sit down for a really long time with five pounds of gummy bears, Twizzlers, and on the box it says, no fat. And you're like, okay, sweet, I'm going to eat no fat, and I'm going to sit down and watch hours and hours of Harry Potter, or whatever it is, and just sit down and don't do anything. Um, and what will happen is you're going to metabolize your glucose to acetyl-CoA, that's glycolysis, the PDC, and then that acetyl-CoA is going to be made into citrate, and when you don't need the energy, the citric acid cycle shuts down and citrate is transported out, okay? And then you can remake oxaloacetate, which could go back in here, but what we get back out is the acetyl-CoA, so that's the citrate shuttle or the citrate transport system. And then that acetyl-CoA is a two-carbon unit, and we're going to build a fat using the two-carbon unit. And so we'll build it two carbons at a time, and so this will take several rounds. And if you remember, the materials that we need for this are acetyl-CoA, NAD, PH, and ATP. And I will tell you what we're going to make at the end of this is a 16 colon zero fatty acid called palmitate. So if this is 16 colon zero, that means there are 16 carbons here. And if acetyl-CoA carries um, two at a time, then you're going to need eight of those total. For every um, round of fatty acid synthesis, it's gonna require um, two NADPHs, and so here we have seven rounds, so you're going to need 14 of those, and then it's, it's going to turn out that you're going to need seven of those, and I can't really explain that without showing you um, how we get to those seven. But just so you know, that's where we're headed. Um, we're not done today until we've gotten to all 16 carbons and palmitate will have, will be all carbon hydrogens, except for that one will be a carboxylic acid. Okay, oh, I just did this. What's needed to start? I don't know why I did this on two. Oh, right, because the structures are here. Um, so this is NADPH, and the reason that you know it's PH and not NADH is because there's a phosphate here. This is acetyl-CoA. Hopefully you're able to draw the structure of this by now. And again, here's carbon-1, and here's carbon-2. It's a two-carbon carrier. And then we're going to need... ATP because we're going to do be doing synthesis, biosynthesis of a fatty acid. Okay, so the very first step begins with converting some acetyl-CoA into uh, this molecule called malonyl-CoA. And the enzyme that does this is called acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And it's analogous to... pyruvate carboxylase in the gluconeogenesis where you take pyruvate, you add a bicarbonate to it to get to oxaloacetate. So if you remember, we went pyruvate to OAA, pyruvate is three carbons, oxaloacetate is four carbons, and in order to get um, our carbons to 
match on both sides, we have to add bicarbonate in, and this costs us an ATP. to drive this reaction forward, and a biotin. And so the almost the exact same thing happens here, um, except for we're going to be starting with an acetyl-CoA. And we'll add bicarbonate, HCO3. You may also see this as just CO2. They're sort of equivalents of each other. They're just one carbon carriers. And we're, that makes um, a three-carbon molecule called malonyl-CoA. Okay, so hopefully you can see that there's three carbons here. One, two, three. This is carbon one, this is carbon two, and this is carbon three. And this is called malonyl-CoA, and it is a three-carbon carrier. And it is different from our propanyl-CoA because propanyl-CoA uh, was all reduced carbons. This was propanyl-CoA. So propanyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA are both three carbon carriers, um, but propanyl-CoA has um, these last two carbons on the end are completely reduced, whereas malonyl-CoA has the uh, carboxylate group on the end. Okay, both of these enzymes require biotin because if you remember, biotin is a CO2 carrier. Okay, let's take a look at this. All right, so here on this side is the acetyl-CoA carboxylase enzyme, and it's the diagram for it is here. So it has three parts to it. It has the biotin carboxylase part, the biotin carrier part, and the transcarboxylase. Basically, you just need to know that it uh, has three subunits. Sub, bar. We'll just put there. It has three subunits. Okay, so the first step that happens is that the bicarbonate or the HCO3 is added to biotin. So first step is HCO3 minus is added to biotin, which if you'll remember is vitamin B7. Um, it's added to bio biotin and this costs Oops, this costs an ATP because it's energetically unfavorable to force that CO2 or HCO3 onto the biotin. So this costs us an ATP to ADP and PI for every bicarbonate that's added. And that's okay. It's okay to use an ATP in this step because if you're making a fat, you have to have a lot of excess energy. Again, you're sitting down um, eating all eating and eating and eating and not moving. So you've got an excess of ATP, so you can use some of that energy to do this. And then if you'll remember, biotin is the swinging arm, so it can move, it's really long, it can move between subunits. And the second step is that biotin swings over, biotin plus the CO2 swings over and reacts with acetyl-CoA to become malonyl-CoA or mal-CoA. Okay, so the acetyl-CoA is here, it's gonna react with that CO2 and what we get out is malonyl-CoA and so the final step is that malonyl-CoA leaves. Again, same thing happens in pyruvate carboxylase. Um, this is acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And if you remember, most of these enzymes are named for their substrate, and then the second part of their name is what they do. So pyruvate carboxylase adds a CO2 to pyruvate. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase adds a CO2 to an acetyl group. Okay, and so the overall reaction is that you have biotin um, plus your CO2 and acetyl-CoA, um, malonyl-CoA, 
is created and you get biotin back out and this of course costs you so we would add ATP over here ADP and PI and this is the rate limiting step in the process of fatty acid synthesis and we're going to talk um, briefly about why it is that we even need to make this intermediate malonyl coa like why can't we just start shoving the acetyl coas together um, and there is a reason that we have to go through this intermediate called malonyl coa okay so then the next thing is going to go is this malonyl coa is going to go on to the second enzyme which is called fatty acid synthase and here we're doing the mammalian version which is type 1 um, and it has it's this really long interconnected well, let's call it like an assembly line protein and the mammalian version has the assembly line the plant and bacteria version is not an assembly line but each of these colors here is a different subunit and they all have different functions but we're really only going to focus on this ACP and the KS domain and that's because that's where most of the interesting things happen and so what you'll notice is that ACP and the KS domain both have these thiol groups. In the KS domain, the thiol is coming from a cysteine, and then ACP, which is acyl carrier protein, um, is an SH um, on a modified serine. So it's kind of like a cysteine, um, but it's uh, the end of a pantothenic acid group. So if you remember pantothenic acid, um, was another vitamin, and I'm pretty sure it was B5. And a compare, this is a comparison of ACL carrier protein with CoA. Um, they both have the pantothenic acid group, which is in purple. So that means these are both derived from vitamins. But the ACL carrier protein is connected to this serine. But you'll see that they both end in an SH which is why coenzyme A is often abbreviated as CoA-SH. And then ACL carrier protein is also abbreviated ACP-SH because that SH, that thiol group, is going to be the one that will react to create thioester groups. Okay, there's a ton of different cartoon representations of fatty acid synthase and I just wanted to show you a couple um, just so you can see the variety of different ways that this can be represented. Uh, I personally like this version the best, this kind of snaky looking version. Um, again, you can see the SH on ACP and you can see the SH on the KS domain. This is what all of the domains or all the subunits are called. You don't need to memorize these um, it's just a really, really, really big, giant enzyme complex. Think of it similar to like the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex with all the subunits. This is sort of similar to that. Um, a co another common representation is a sort of wheel-looking one where you have the ACP in the middle, and then here's the KS domain. It's linked up to an acetyl group, and then all the other domains are around. And the reason that people like to show it in this version is that this acyl carrier protein is basically going to take the uh, product and intermediates and move it to each of the different subunits so that they can do their reaction. Um, in this version right here, the acyl carrier protein again with this, I don't know, uh, flexible linker, it's able to swing to all the different subunits so they can do the different reactions. And we'll have an animation in class that shows you how efficient it is to have all these subunits linked together instead of having them separate. Anyways. Okay, and then um, my favorite, my other favorite view is like the real view. So it turns out that this is a dimer. So we're usually only looking at one half of it. This is would be like the snake-like version, but it's a dimer. In the type 1, again, it's a dimer of two identical peptide chains. It's humongous. Um, fatty acid synthase type 2, which is in plants and bacteria, has all the same domains, but they're all um, unlinked. They're not 
connected together. So you'd find like the KS domain somewhere and then the DH domain and then ER um, uh, and then MAT domain, they would all be disconnected. The other reason that I like this is that it looks almost like a headless teddy bear. So like here's the head of where the teddy bear head would be and there's its legs and its body, or I'm sorry, its arms and its legs. Anyways, that's why I like this view because it looks like a headless teddy bear. Okay, it's just really big. It's just really big and all the subunits are connected. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so here we go. Let's get things started. Um, the first thing that's going to happen, and we'll draw this out in even more detail, um, the first thing that's going to happen is that you need to load an acetyl-CoA onto um, the KS domain, and then you need to load a mal-CoA onto the ACP domain. So this only happens, this very first step only happens once per palmitate. The rest of the rounds, you don't need to keep loading on the acetyl-CoA. So every other round, um, you'll do this, the second part, every round. You'll do this only once. Okay. So this one already has the acetyl-CoA loaded onto KS, and then the mal-CoA here is loading onto um, the acyl carrier protein, so that thiol will attack the carbonyl and break the thiol ester bond, so that's where you get your CoA, SH, or your coenzyme A coming out so that you have malonyl-CoA is up here, and you have your acetyl-CoA right there. Now there's a question on the side here, which I'm going to come back to a few times, which is why is it that we even need to make the malonyl-CoA in the first place? Like why can't we just load an acetyl-CoA up here? And the reason is, is because malonyl-CoA can create a good nucleophile. Whereas acetyl CoA is only a good electrophile. Okay, so in this diagram, and we'll we'll draw it out again. The generation of the nucleophile is as follows. This CO2, if you can probably cannot see that. All right, so the generation of the nucleophile is as follows. This group right here is a really good leaving group. It's super stable once it leaves. It's going to be CO2. So carboxylate, which means to remove the carboxylic acid, put those electrons on this, and this becomes a carbanion, which is our, so that's a lone pair of electrons with a negative charge. That becomes a good nucleophile, which then can attack this good electrophile, and then we break that bond. So the reason that we make malonyl-CoA is because malonyl-CoA is able to generate a good nucleophile, whereas acetyl-CoA is not able to generate a good nucleophile. So if you had loaded up two acetyl-CoAs, Oops. So if you had put, um, let's do ACP to KS. This is how I like to do it. So let's say you had loaded up um, an acetyl-CoA on KS, and you loaded up an acetyl-CoA on the acyl carrier protein. There's no way that these two can react with each other. There's, there's nothing. They're both electrophiles. Okay. So that's why. All right, we're going to draw this. I think this is in your packet um, that I gave you. So if you want to follow along there or just draw it on a piece of paper. Uh, this is, again, the opposite, roughly the opposite, not the exact. 
but a rough opposite of beta oxidation. All right. Can I zoom on this one? There we go. Okay, so the very first step is you need to load. So this is going to be for the first round of fatty acid synthase. All right, so the first step is to load up. So the two domains that are drawn here are the ones with the thiols. And the KS domain will load up with an acetyl-CoA. And the ACP domain will load up with a malonyl-CoA. All right, so these thiols here come here, we'll break this thioester. Okay, so in this round we're gonna lose two coenzyme A's. So the ACPs are now loaded. Malonyl CoA is loaded up on ACP, and then acetyl CoA is loaded up on KS. Now I'm going to number the carbon so that you can see which carbons are moving where. I'm going to call this carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3. This will be carbon 4 and carbon number 5. Okay, as in the previous slide, um, the what's happening here is a condensation. Okay, where there's a whole bunch of electron pairs here. This uh, carboxylate group on the end is going to decarboxylate. We're going to move the electrons to that carbon in the middle. It's going to become a carbanion, which can attack the electrophile here and break that thioester. So what's coming out is CO2, and that is carbon number 3. And then what we have on ACP is that these carbons here have swung up to the ACP. So we still have carbon number one attached to carbon number two. I'm trying to decide how I wanted to draw that. To carbon number two. And carbon number two, if you'll notice, is covalently bonded to carbon number four, which is still attached to carbon number five. So this is two, four, and five, and again, carbon number three is over here and it left as CO2. So now we have a single chain that's going to be um, reduced because we need to get all the way to all CH2s, that's what's on a fatty acid, um, and they're all located on the ACP. Okay, next we have a reduction step, and the electrons here are supplied by NAD, pH, and of course we need our H+, plus, and that's going to be oxidized to NAD, P+, plus as the growing carbon chain is reduced. So we're going to add two we're going to add our electrons here, so S, O, going to get one of the hydrogens there, and the second hydrogen there. So right now we've added, that's a methyl group, so we added the two electrons onto um, carbon, we added one, oh yeah, we added one of the hydrogens onto carbon number four, um, and one of the hydrogens onto the oxygen that's attached to carbon number four. Okay. And then the next step is a uh, dehydration. Now remember, all we're trying to do is to get all of our carbons to be CH2 bonds. We're trying to get rid of the oxygens and replace them with um, electrons. So the dehydration is going to, let me draw my hydrogens here, 
is going to pull that off and that off. And if you'll notice, that makes water. And what results from that is a double bond. Okay, at least we've got the oxygen off now. And finally, we need to reduce those carbons again to get all the way to just carbon, hydrogen, and carbon-carbon single bonds. And this is where the second NAD pH comes in. And those hydrogens um, are going to be added across the double bonds so that we get a single bond. And again, I have one, two, three, four carbons, which makes sense. I should have had four carbons the whole time. Three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then um, we started with five carbons, and that's where our fifth carbon is. Okay, and then the very last step um, is a transfer step. where the growing carbon chain is going to be moved onto Ks. Okay, and the reason that it's moved onto Ks is because the new malonyl-CoA always enters on to ACP. So that gets us back to the beginning here. Um, and we don't add in a second acetyl-CoA because we've already got the KS region started. So that's why we only start with one acetyl-CoA, but every time we add in um, a malonyl-CoA. So if we go around and around and around again, 16 colon 0, palmitate, um, the number of rounds is it's sort of the same for breaking it down, but it's the number of carbons divided by two minus one. So here that's going to be seven rounds. Each round costs two NAD pHs. So that should be 14 of those. And um, it's going to, we need, we always have one acetyl-CoA period and then the number of malonyl coas is the number of round, is the number of rounds yeah number of mal coa equals the number of rounds so here that should be 7 and we'll do the chemical equations to show that it all it all trickles down to be um, exactly what we needed to start with and exactly what we needed to end with Okay, so um, again, this is another cartoon representation, but you'll notice this is the first round here where you have acetyl-CoA and your malonyl-CoA, and then this is the second round, and you've added a malonyl-CoA, but no acetyl-CoA because you're building the carbon chain um, at that location. Third round, add a malonyl-CoA. Fourth round, Malonyl CoA, four more rounds, um, and you get to palmitate. So you'll notice that the carbon chain grows by two carbons every single time. Okay, so let's uh, figure out where everything's coming from. So I said, if you remember, I said that we need, what we need is acetyl CoA, we need NADPH, and we need ATP in order to make. Um, a fatty acid. So let's see if we can get to just those three things as what we needed. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase was acetyl-CoA plus an HCO3 minus plus ATP goes to, how much room do I have, um, mal-CoA plus ADP plus PI. And that's just for one round, for one acetyl-CoA. Fatty acid synthase takes one acetyl-CoA plus mal-CoA. We'll add in the numbers of things that we need. Plus NADPH. 
plus H plus. Ooh, that looks bad. And that gets us to palmitate, which is 16 carbons, plus CO2, plus CoA, plus NAD, P, P, NADP plus, and water. All right, so now we need amounts of things. So palmitate is 16 carbons. I know that I'm only ever going to put one acetyl-CoA into fatty acid synthase, and that's two carbons right there. And the rest of the carbons are coming from mal-CoA. And I will get one of the mal-CoA carbons is going to come out as CO2. Um, and so it's going to take me seven of those. So if I get two, um, and I do seven times two is 14, plus two I get to 16. And really, it's 7 times 3, which is 21, because I have um, 7 of those as well. Okay. Um, and it took me 7 rounds, and there's 2 NADPH costs um, per round, so that's 14 of those, 14 of those, 14 of those, um, 1 water per round, so 7 of those, 7 CO2 is 1 per round. And then I have 7 coas here one CoA there, so that's got to be eight total. Now, if I if this is going to cost seven malonyl CoAs, then that means my acetyl-CoA carboxylase is going to have to spit out seven of those, which means I need seven of those going in, seven of those going in, seven, seven, and seven. So if I combine everything, I'm going to combine them to get to fatty acid synthesis. Okay, so this is going to be fatty acid okay we're going to cross some things out that are on both sides of the equation so you'll notice that that mal-CoA is going to cross out with that mal-CoA This HCO3 minus is going to cancel out that H0 or that CO2, their equivalents. And nothing else is the same on both sides. So what I'm left with is seven of those and one of those means I need eight acetyl CoAs. I need seven ATPs and 14 NADPH. You're probably like, where the heck are you going with this? Okay. Acetyl-CoA, ATP, and NADPH. Acetyl-CoA, NADPH, and ATP. And then that will get us to 16 colon 0 palmitate. Okay, so if I have two carbons in acetyl CoA, 2 times 8 is 16, so that makes sense. 7 ADPs, 7 PIs, uh, 14 NAD, P plus, 8. Coas and seven waters. Whew, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of energy that this costs. You can think of NAD um, pH as an equivalent of NADH, um, and if each of those is worth 2.5 ATPs, that's a lot of ATPs. Um, so if I had 14 times 14 NAD pH. And then it's 2.5 ATPs per NAD pH. Let me just do that math quick. This is just off the top of my... Ah, come back here. That's 3.5. 
35 ATPs plus the outright 7 and 35 and 7 is 42 ATPs. So it costs 42 ATPs to make one fatty acid. And trust me, you're making a lot more than just one fatty acid. Um, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of fatty acids are made here. Okay. All right, so to the final question. Why is it that eating too much sugar turns into fat? And if I could... Um, would you like to turn your fat into sugar? If I could give you an enzyme, would you want it? So let's do this question first. Um, and this would be a good time to stop the video if you want to go get a cup of hot coffee or take a break. Um, I'm going to draw out the cell diagram one more time so that we can connect having sitting down for your Harry Potter marathon with your five pound tub of Twizzlers and how that is not <laughs> is going to lead to um, that sugar turning into fat and being stored in your body. All right, let's do this. Okay. Matrix. Cytosol. Uh, outer membrane, inner membrane, cytoplasmic membrane. I'm not going to draw all the pathways, only the ones that we need to get from sugar to fat. Okay, so you sit down and you eat your um, gummy bears or your Twizzlers, so you've got a really high concentration of glucose in the bloodstream. That glucose comes in and goes through glycolysis to pyruvate. Um, some of it may be stored as glycogen but let's assume that you have maximized your glycogen storage and all the rest of the sugar um, can no longer be stored as glycogen because there's no more space for it. And so some of it will be stored as glycogen. And, you know, I'm going to add in just a tinge of detail here. This specifically is coming from G6P. Okay. Um, some of this will go onto the pentose phosphate pathway, so we'll get... Um, ribose 5-phosphate, CO2, and then we get our NADPH here. Uh, UTP is going in here. NADH is here. ATP is here. And then pyruvate is moved or shuttled into the matrix and made into acetyl-CoA. Okay, and that spits out NADH and a CO2. Okay, now, if we go a little bit backwards here, go from OAA to citrate. Okay, and then TCA cycle is here. In times where there's lots and lots and lots of um, ATP being made, the TCA cycle shuts down, so what you end up with is high concentrations of citrate. And in high concentrations of citrate, citrate gets transported out through the citrate shuttle. Okay, citrate goes back to OAA, and that's how we shuttle out the acetyl-CoA that we need to make a fat. All right? And then goes to malate and to pyruvate. And this takes in an NADH. And this spits out an NADPH. So we get some more materials for making a fat. And then, of course, that pyruvate can enter back in here. And it either goes here or it goes to OAA and then gluconeogenesis. Okay, now, acetyl-CoA will be made into malonyl-CoA. So mal-CoA, this costs ATP, and we need our HCO3 minus, so this costs ATP, 
And then malonyl-CoA enters into fatty acid synthase, goes around and around and around, and one, one acetyl-CoA. Seven of those, one of those. So this is fatty acid synthase. This up here is acetyl, uh, there's really no good abbreviation for this, acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And we need to input NADPH, we'll need 14 of those, okay? And it goes around and around and around again until what comes out is 16 colon 0, um, fatty acid called palmitate. And this palmitate can be packaged into a tag for um, transport out to adipose tissue. through the chylomicron transport system or the VLDL transport system. Okay, so let's see if we can trace this. I'm going to do, I'm going to use red to trace through. Okay, large amounts of sugar. Come on in. Some of it will go into pentose phosphate pathway. Um, some of that sugar will go up to glycogen storage until you run out of room. And then the rest of it gets made into pyruvate which gets shuttled into the mitochondrial matrix to be made into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA combines with OAA to become citrate. High, concentra well, high concentration of citrate builds up because the TCA cycle is shut down. So that citrate is shuttled out, and you get your acetyl-CoA in the mitochondrial matrix. I'm sorry, in the cytosol. Um, the acetyl-CoA is converted into malonyl-CoA so that you get a good nucleophile. And then seven malonyl-CoAs and one acetyl-CoA go into fatty acid synthase to make a fat. So that is how you get from eating too much sugar to being turned into fat, and then it gets transported back out. Now, my second question, well, oh, let's connect some of these other pieces. NADPH and NADPH that's going to supply the materials. Um, the acetyl-CoA, I've got that connected. Uh, you've got your ATP right here. That can supply that ATP. Um, you'll also get some ATP coming out of oxidative phosphorylation that can also supply some energy. And then my second question was, um, if I could give you an enzyme that would convert fat into sugar, so go in the opposite way. Would you want it? Okay, and I would hope that you would say no thank you, <laughs> or polite pass, uh, because if you were to store most of your energy as sugar, you would look like a giant pumpkin or a tree, or something like that. So the organisms that are able to store their energy as sugar are able to get really, really, really big. Like trees are able to grow branches and leaves, and their um, trunks get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because you need a lot of space to be able to store sugar. Okay, so it actually is a benefit to you that we store a lot of our energy as fat because it takes up a little teeny tiny, a lot less space than sugar does. Um, and I know that fat, or like being fat, uh, having fat on your body is sort of demonized, but man, you'd be way, way bigger if you stored um, all of your energy as sugar. So I would say um, to someone, I'd be like, um, no, I'm good. Unless you have a way of like excreting out your excess sugar, then you could go from fat to sugar to excreting it in urine, and then that would actually uh, cause you to lose weight or lose the fat. Anyways, that's all I have, um, and that's our very last uh, set of metabolic pathways. After this, we're going to do regulation, and I know you're super excited, but I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.